Welcome, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here. I'm Carla Murdoch. I'm director of the Mudd Center for Ethics, and I uh, welcome you to the second lecture in our Ethics of Design series. Effective design can be invisible to us, even though it shapes our lives in really important ways. So this makes design a very compelling topic for ethical interrogation. Designers craft products, programs, policies, technologies, strategies, and experiences that express a particular vision or optimize certain outcomes. Last month, the aerospace engineer and scholar of societal development, Professor Danielle Wood, described the sources of wisdom she draws from and the methodologies she uses to design for sustainability on Earth and in space. She emphasized that ethical design requires not only scholarly expertise, but also intentionality and collaboration. Today, the designer George A. will shift our gaze toward practices that are crystallized within our disciplines that may make it challenging for us to manifest our values in our work. Before I welcome our guests to the stage, let's pause to appreciate the land that surrounds us and those who have cared for it for centuries, the Yisa and their descendants, the Monacan people. In accepting the privilege of dwelling on this land, we are called upon to be proactive in learning the full story and responding in a manner that reflects our values. In this effort, I hope you'll join the third annual Indigenous Community Meal sponsored by the Native American Student Organization and the Campus Kitchen at WNL. The evening will include guided discussions around the history of colonization in America, indigenous sovereignty, and the complexities of the Thanksgiving holiday. The meal will highlight indigenous ingredients and techniques. The event will be on Thursday, November 11th at 5.30 p.m. in Evans Dining Hall, and you do need to pre-register to participate. I have one more announcement before we get to the main event. As part of the Ethics of Design program, the Mudd Center and Labern Library are coordinating a human library event at Washington and Lee. The human library provides a framework for having difficult conversations about experiences of stereotyping, hardship, misunderstanding, and prejudice. It involves conversations between human books and readers. Human books are people who volunteer to start a dialogue about an aspect of their experience or identity that's exposed them to stigma, hardship, or prejudice. Readers sign up to check out a human book so they can listen, learn, and ask questions. The human library provides a safe space for us to talk about things that otherwise we might not. If you are someone who might be interested in volunteering as a human book, I hope you'll reach out to one of the human library event organizers or attend an information session that will be happening during the next month. So more information about the human library and about the indigenous community meal is available on the table right out beside the door as you walk out. I encourage you to grab some of that information as you go. And now it's my pleasure to introduce George A. He is the co-founder and director of innovation at Greater Good Studio in Chicago. After working as a designer for several years at a global innovation firm, he was hired as the first human-centered designer at the Chicago Transit Authority. From there, he co-founded the Greater Good Studio, a social design consultancy studio with an explicit equity and inclusion-based mission. It uses human-centered design practices in projects that address community development, civic participation, public health, education, and the arts. A's work has interrogated practices baked into the discipline of design that may put designers at risk of straying from their values or doing more harm than good. His lecture today will address that quiet little voice when design and ethics collide. So welcome. Hello. Okay. I think I checked it. Yeah, I think so. 
hello. Can I just check, is the microphone working? Yay. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. It really has been um, a real treat to be visiting uh, this university. Uh, on the, in the preparation for this trip, I was um, emailing with Kate, and uh, as a sign of just how much care everyone's taken with me, uh, I informed her through my, uh, like a screenshot of my itinerary, oh, I'm gonna be going to Charlotte, North Carolina. And she was so kind and saying, wait, wait, what? Where are you going? I said, you know, Charlotte, North Carolina. She goes, that's, that's, that's the wrong one. Um, and uh, was very, 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 very gracious about making sure I was ended up at the right town and the right airport. So uh, thank you very much, Kate, for, for making sure that I wasn't in the wrong place. Uh, I would have been much slower. Um, I am thrilled to be here, and uh, I'm really excited to be able to be part of the uh, ethics series. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, meet with all of you, and I'm really hoping to be able to get into a, a dialogue afterwards. The talk will, will be about 25 minutes or so, 20 minutes, and hopefully we'll have a lot of Q&A. Does that sound okay? Great. The, uh, the slides are not advancing, unfortunately. Hmm. Ah, okay. Okay, now they are. Thank you. Can I just do a quick show of hands and see your familiarity with this term, human-centered design? If you haven't heard about it much, you can keep your hand low a little bit, and if you do it every day, keep it nice and high. Does that sound okay? Can I see general height of hands, there we go. Okay, that's good. Um, if you are not familiar with it at all, that's totally, totally fine. Uh, I'm not expecting anybody to have to be. Uh, if you are not familiar, uh, it likes to present itself as a very linear, very simple, very logical process uh, that sort of talks about framing problems, understanding humans as they are, trying to design responses to them, and it usually features some type of like cute color graphics in a sequence, and these are the cute color graphics that we have for our studio as we talk about human-centered design. Um, I want to talk about human-centered design because there's a really unusual story about how it impacted the lives of absolutely millions of people. Um, and it starts with two designers studying at Stanford. I'm going to read these quotes, okay? Uh, it's from Stanford's own alumni magazine. Monzies and Bowen approached smokers on campus and asked them what they loved and hated about their habit. Their complaints were consistent. Fear of being seen with a cigarette and paranoia about smelling of smoke on a first date. Isn't that a good insight? Their first uh, prototypes were ad hoc assemblies of bespoke components and items found on drugstore shelves. They were studying and followed all of the advice that was given to them around human-centered design. Understanding the problem, understanding humans and their behavior, and then designing responses for them. Now, this is unfortunately where the story goes a little bit sideways, because rather than this impacting positively for millions and millions of people, which is kind of the general cheerleading that we typically hear around human-centered design, this is the story of the dual e-cigarette, uh, a product that has become, up until probably COVID, one of the larger sort of public health scourges that I think has existed of recent uh, uh, memory. The design of that product is so remarkably attuned to humans it feels to me like they weaponized human-centered design against the very people that they were trying to design for. Now, I've heard many people have actually said to me that this product has actually helped with smoking cessation. And for those folks, great. But somewhere along the line, when they started designing uh, fruit-flavored pods and then marketing to lots and lots of high schoolers, clearly something went a bit awry. Can you see the problem with this? That the idea of being able to design a really neat package for how to get the effects of nicotine into your body without perhaps some of the inconvenience of actually burning tobacco is what became so attractive to uh, many people. Unfortunately, not probably uh, the, the, uh, you know, some regulatory bodies, but it definitely got on the radar of Philip Morris uh, because they wanted to attach it to their addiction portfolio. So the product and the phenomena of an e-cigarette, I think, it really doesn't get a lot of airtime when it gets described as being one of the many ways in which human-centered design can produce results in the world. Just because, again, the, the cheerleading that we typically hear about makes human-centered design feel like it's always a force for good, when I think the equal chance of it being a force for something else is equally present. It does make me wonder then, perhaps, how did we lose our way? How does an industry or a design team, perhaps, end up producing something that was so obviously going to be a problem and didn't get interrupted or stopped along the way. Now, design has adapted and diversion to many threads over the decades. 
and whether or not you identify on one of these branches of design, because there are many, many of them right now, it does need to be addressed that perhaps at its core, there are some elements of design as a discipline that I think don't really show up until we start entering more and more complex social spaces outside of the ones that perhaps design was primarily built for, which is really commercial design, commercial products, and commercialism in general. And it's not as though we aren't lacking in guidelines for what makes good design. Is anyone familiar with this uh, German designer? He's still alive. His name's Dieter Rams. He's the guy. Um, and I know I certainly referenced uh, Dieter's 10 principles for good design for, uh, for many years as a design professor myself. Good design is innovative. Good design makes a product useful. All of these, if you notice, and then compare against that jewelry cigarette, you'll be surprised, actually, the jewelry cigarette still passes the test of getting through those 10. If you even look at number six, good design is honest. That product will honestly kill you. So somehow, it's almost as though, no, I don't think it's Dita's fault, you know, Herr Rams' fault per se, but I think the general air of design remains almost morally agnostic. It almost presumes we couldn't possibly do harm. So what we mostly want to do is make sure that what we do design is for the very best it can be. What we have generally is a craft-based framework for good design. And I would probably say that that's primarily what we mostly judge design students for in their classes. I know I probably would. But I think it brings up a, an interesting observation that perhaps what we lack instead is an ethical-based framework for good design that might go alongside that craft-based one. I'm curious if there could be conversations around what those ethical standards might be to go alongside the grades you might be given as a design student at a university like this. So generally what we have, because of this lack of anything kind of bigger than any of ourselves, is we have this, like a BYOE scenario where each person is individually bringing their own ethics to each project, to each classroom, to each design studio which makes for a slightly inconsistent set of ethical guidelines as an industry. It's been like that for a really, really long time. And unfortunately, if you look compared to perhaps other professional uh, industries, engineering, law, or you know, medicine, those would be, uh, have requirements for how you practice those professions, usually with an ethical standard and more. But because design, I think, is still rooted, has this craft-based mentality, almost as like trades, the pursuit of becoming professional is somewhat stymied by the fact that we don't have an ethical set of standards. It's sort of like caught between being taken more seriously, even though I know it wants to be, and yet not without all the, the rigor that perhaps it might require. Now, let me back up. So um, as I was kindly introduced by Carla, I'm one of the co-founders at Greater Good Studio. We're based in Chicago, and we've been so fortunate for the last 12 years to be able to work on projects full-time um, without the usual conundrum of wanting to do commercial design work that helps offset the work for, let's say, nonprofits. Uh, all our work is for uh, social sector clients. Um, and we have sort of founded the studio uh, on a set of beliefs that we believe are still just as important then as they are now. Uh, that status quo is unacceptable. I think that that's probably one of the larger things that we are pushing up against. Uh, lived experience is expertise. Uh, we've often seen that lived experience is one of a, maybe like a discounted kind of expertise alongside the one that we usually have, which is learned experience. Uh, that's usually the ones that you will list on your LinkedIn profile, uh, but that your lived experience tends to be sort of like much cheapened, unfortunately. We would like to say that that's just as valuable as any other. And that design is transformative. That founding belief that the design that we do for our clients can transform others, but we can also be transformed in that work as well. The kinds of projects we work on tend to be uh, uh, more like evergreen topic areas. They're not things that can neatly be wrapped into a project timeline, and it seems naive to try to imagine that these are the kinds of projects you can somehow do in a 16-week sprint. Um, to approach them with the same longitudinal view that it took to make and establish these phenomena is probably the same attitude we should approach the projects with as well. If it took decades to get here, it probably is going to take decades to dismantle. And perhaps we can play a small role in that as well. Our discipline, and I think everything, every kind of training I ever had, often, almost in a Pavlovian sense, trained me to say yes to opportunities. We were never really ever given all that much opportunity to practice saying no. And it seems that as you start to do more and more design work, um, this is a unfortunately a bit of a heads up for those who have yet to enter industry, you might find yourself feeling a little compromised. 
maybe, maybe repeatedly. And the idea of being able to say no, at least in the time that I came up during my career, it always seemed very taboo and something whispered. But generally, the assumption was, well, obviously, we're going to say yes. We just have to work out when, how exactly, but never, never should. It was always just generally, how could we do it? And it seems that in, in lieu of there being any kind of real ethical guidelines or anything, to, so like a set of standards as a studio or even as an industry, I noticed that there was this other thing that was sort of replacing it, that quiet little voice I've called, where perhaps your conscience is, is no, maybe not sometimes quietly, maybe screaming at sometimes, saying, bro, there's something wrong with this. And I think what's so sad about for, for my experience is that I kept going shh every time that voice would say something. I always shushed it because it always said something at the worst possible time. Are folks familiar with this phenomenon of having a voice whispering something as in like, there's something really weird about this. Can we talk about it? Why is this? Why do I feel so funny? And the usual answer for me was not only to shush it, but say, this is not a good time right now. I've got more important things to do. Um, uh, I'm, trying to make, I'm trying to make some headway. Uh, I'm trying to establish myself. All of these excuses I often would say because these voices kept coming up at the wrong times. These examples I'm going to put up here, about 10 or so, I think are endemic of the kinds of questions that not only that I remember hearing, but also maybe questions you may have either said to yourself or may, uh, may, may hear from your inner voice. Um, I'd love to talk about these at some point as well, perhaps over dinner or wherever else. Uh, what is design's relationship to power and privilege? Which humans are we centering when we say human-centered design? Who gets to be called a designer? How do we wean design's addiction from whiteness? How can designers say no to work when we need to pay off our student debt, rent, medical debt, whatever it might be? Design is often sink or swim, but why is drowning so common? This industry is brutal. How do designers decide which people in need to serve? There can be a curious uh, calculus there. Why does philanthropy, not community, set the agenda for social change? What's the cost of speaking up? But what's the cost if we don't? There's a real corrosive quality to not having to say something when you know something is up. And I think, unfortunately, we really discount the value of that as well. And if those first nine questions weren't bad enough, this last one's a real doozy, uh, what right do I have to do this work? The way these questions came about, uh, just so you know, was I was invited to teach a class at Northwestern University up in Chicago. And because they have a 10-week quarter system, I like, came to me like, hey, maybe what if every week we ended up doing a different question? So the ways in which the class worked and these questions worked was that every week we'd end up tackling a different one. But I think these, there's nothing that profound about the questions as opposed to wanting to remind you that those questions are probably in you, they're probably in you right now, and that whether you have the similar 10 or another 10 or 100, I want you to try and see if you can make sure that that voice doesn't become numb, that you haven't tuned it out, and that over time over your career, that we get better and better by listening to that voice inside of you. And it's those observations around the design industry that has allowed me to, I think, to be able to get a little bit of recognition for some of the writing. I don't really identify as a writer, but I have found that some of the writing I've been able to do has really picked up some good resonance, whether it's around design education and thinking about power, uh, trying to define what good might mean, or even talking recollections with other alumni um, who have worked in the same global design studio trying to look about their experiences and around like workplace trauma. As we've done some of this writing, we've been seeing that there's still this like overarching gap in the design industry around actually how we think about this, this currency that shows up in so much of the work that we do, this notion of power. Uh, the concept of power, I think, is often easy to maybe write off as being, well, let's see, uh, we have uh, airstrikes going off in the Gaza Strip right now, so that's a form of power that is absolutely 100% real. Um, and I think that that can be the predominant norm in which when we think about power being showing up as a force. But there's also a version of power that is much smaller at a scale of one-on-one -on -one interpersonal in a classroom or in a team that I also want to equate, because I feel like if we only think about power as something that happens at an international scale, we might miss some of the ways in which power shows up when we work in, in, on projects. So this definition for power I found to be so helpful for my co-founder, Sarah. She wrote, power as the ability to change another person's reality. 
this definition works so well even at the international uh, uh, world leader level, but certainly at the level of really being amongst teams. And I think when we think about maybe the time when your reality has been changed in an instant, perhaps over a Slack message or a text, you might want to think a little bit about how much power that person has over you. Similarly, the last time you sent a text or a Slack message to someone and then changed their reality for months on end might indicate how much power you might have over them as well. So power does work, I think, at this smaller scale, not just the world leader level. And I think alongside this definition for power, I think it's helpful to think about this observation that we have around power asymmetry. Uh, how I describe it is power is often lopsided. But the shorthand that a lot of people have used for a long time is the idea of something called power dynamics. Are folks familiar with that term? Or maybe the phrase might be, man, there were some really weird power dynamics in that last meeting. Anyone heard that recently? I've never found it to be that descriptive, but asymmetry I found to be helpful because it helps me realize, oh, right, it was, in, it was more of it in one place and then very, very sparse across others. And to visualize that a little more, I've made this basic triangle, uh, originally in Keynote, to try to describe how f power asymmetry kind of tends to show up as a phenomena. All right, so has anyone here ever started a class or a project or, or, or like been given an assignment? And as soon as you hear about it, you go, I'm never getting out alive. Like this thing doesn't make any sense. The budget's all off. There's no time to do the work properly. I don't even know who this team is. Has anyone ever had a thing like that where you go like, I just, what do they, how am I gonna be successful? I feel like most of my career was spent that way. If you have ever felt powerless to changing something because you feel like you just got given this impossible task, that is you on the sharp pointy end of that triangle. Does that help make this diagram make a little more sense? which means that there's somebody on the wide end pushing that pressure onto you, making, it, making you pinned against the wall, as it were, so that you can't move and get out. There are so many relationships that exist in the world, interpersonally, that have asymmetry built into them that I think highlighting them, for this talk at least, makes us realize, wow, asymmetry is incredibly common. There's even a certain asymmetry between all of you and me because I'm the only one that's mic'd right now, right? Like there are so many, it's so common that we almost forget how um, embedded into our you know, American society asymmetry is. So just to take a look at the sum, law enforcement with detainees, doctors to patients, employees to employees, funders to grantees, teachers to students, landlords to renters, local government with community, and leadership and frontline staff. I don't think this is fixed and forever going to be this way, but for many cases when both sides get given their almost like their scripts, you are starting from a certain position, almost like you've been typecast, which can make it very difficult to work out what can I really do in this case. Now, our studio, if you notice, is called Greater Good Studio. We're supposed to be all about like fight the man, right? You would think that we are really best pals with those on the, on the sharp pointy end trying to figure out how to help them, right? Right. But where do you think across that spectrum from the pointy to the wide end, we actually show up? when we do our projects. Anybody want to take a guess? I think we were really unsure about actually admitting how far over we are. Our studio has to become very chummy with those with great power in order to get projects, in order to get projects, sorry, uh, contracts, to get any research recruiting done, to get paid. The reality is that when we do design work, particularly for those without much power, the way the mechanics of how design is often handled requires a lot of, uh, uh, lot of proximity to power, which can make the projects we do already compromised from the very start. The asymmetry can be so stark, it actually makes it impossible, we think, to maybe do successful projects at all, which is why we might have to then turn them down. I love this quote from Alice Walker. The most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. And I think it's a helpful reminder for a room of people who are starting their careers. You have been told a story of how little power you have repeatedly. That's on purpose. It's helpful to, to keep you there. And I think that that phenomenon is very true across designers and across anyone trying to disrupt how the world works today. So in order for us to be a little disruptive, even to ourselves, 
and all of the training and everything that would tell us in a capitalist society how design is meant to work, we try to see if we can do something called a gut check, this way of interrupting how we do business development in the office. And as a mini plug, I think actually there's a, um, are we sold out for it tomorrow? I think there's a good turnout. Yeah, we're going to be actually doing a gut check workshop tomorrow. So hopefully, I don't know if we can let more people in, but um, we have a, a session tomorrow where we're going to help folks uh, develop their own rubrics uh, so they can start to see if they can build the gut checks for themselves, because I think having some type of mechanism to disrupt the asymmetry as it is, is necessary for a lot of folks. What we found, particularly in the social sector, is that not every question warrants an answer. As similarly put, not every RFP that gets put out in the world needs a response by you. Not every grant that the school applies for really needs to be applied, because some of them are boneheaded. Does that seem fair? Right? I mean, you know this is happening. So sometimes these questions get put out that are inherently flawed, almost hoping to trap somebody by having them, having them respond, which means that it's, out, it's prudent by our studio, but then perhaps by you, is it a good use of your time to respond at all? Do you end up giving it more oxygen than it deserves when perhaps the question itself is already flawed? And while we're very, very proud of the portfolio of projects we've done, which you can see on our website, this bit doesn't get a lot of airtime on us on our website at all. But we've done an interesting practice of doing something called gut checks. We've done about 50 breakup emails where we've done this gut check. And we've had to say, it's so, I'm really sorry, we can't do this. It's not you, it's me. Uh, with the single largest breakup email we ever did uh, was for USAID, which is the federal government's um, uh, international Aid development agency. Uh, and then we've done about 150 gut checks over the last 12 years, constantly checking to see whether or not it's appropriate for us to even have a conversation with some of our clients. It's not to say we start out belligerent and saying, I'm turning you down right from the start. That obviously would sound like a, well, that just sounds rude. Uh, but rather the option to be able to say no, I think is something that we had to be reminded of many, many times. And I'm here to remind you, you have that option as well. In fact, this was the very first breakup email I ever had to write. Uh, I was so terrified by how this would come across, mostly because I kept thinking to myself, who the hell do I think I am to turn this down? It was just so absurd to me that I had the ability to do so. And I had to be heavily coached my co my, by my co-founder. And now after writing many of these, it turns out that there's actually a format and a structure. I would love it if you could take a picture of this, <laughs> because this might help you save a lot of time trying to write your breakup email for when you might be ready to do the same type of thing. It has a basic structure. You say thanks right away, because it's nice to be asked. You say no up front, don't bury the lead. You explain it's not you, it's me, and then try to provide your actual justification, because that's the bit that usually kind of takes a lot more work. And then say, let's stay friends, because you will likely run into them. Most people that you do a breakup email with will never forget you. So you will likely run into them in industry again one day. Makes sense, right? So the justification part, I think, is really important, because usually, we try to avoid that. Like, There's a lot of comfort-seeking measures in most of the world, but, but, but particularly in writing emails. And one of them might be, we don't have capacity. Has anyone written that email? Or had an email like that? Or it's not a good cultural fit. Those types of language obfuscate for why you actually have justification. And I find that it's a shame when we do so, because it means that we miss the opportunity to really dig deep and say, why does this project bother me so much? What about this opportunity is tweaking me out and making me feel as though I just something off about it? It's not to say no right away, but just to say, look, if we can get these issues addressed, maybe we can dig into the project a lot more thoughtfully. So I would argue, as has been the case for this whole talk so far, is that without deliberate intervention, I think that the design industry rarely serves society. There are some explicit goals that it has been embedded in its practice for so long that we don't even recognize them anymore. We were so busy pursuing this thing called design at scale. Does anyone remember this? Designers for a long time were whining like toddlers, saying, we want to see at the table. We want to see at the table. We have chief design officers at most large corporations today. We are good. Design is at scale now. What we haven't stopped to pause for is to check whether or not we are causing harm at scale. Design is an accelerant that gets attached to almost anything that it wants to be bought into. And we have to be cautious and perhaps even check, is it appropriate for us to be in this conversation right now? And when we're so busy to trying to get to one aspect, we may not even notice perhaps there are other harms happening along the way. The dual e-cigarette is the only latest one that I've heard of that would remind us of such a thing. 
And when we think about that design tree at its root, it's worth mentioning maybe a couple of things that I do think it does particularly well. Design is built for building capital, which I think is primarily what most people would probably assume is truly what we do. It helps build capital and has done for decades. This other part though, seeking comfort, I find it to be something that doesn't get a lot of airtime. It took me a while to even notice it. There's a lot of seek comfort seeking measures that come along for design, both in how we try to do accommodation for different types of users, but also I think there's, a, there's an aspect of it that makes us feel as though if we were to be perturbed, we're not doing our job properly. And I would argue that perhaps right now when design does both, it's very, very attractive to certain people. Who do you think is most attracted to building capital and seeking comfort? The most powerful, of course. They think having capital and being comfortable is theirs by right, which makes design particularly attractive to them when we think about how we maybe pitch for projects and who's calling us for work. And I say if you were to, let's just take a peek at your phones, every major brand has a dark side that was brought to you by design very intentionally. There are teams in the hundreds if not thousands working diligently to do everything they can to get your attention towards their products because that's the goal of how design has worked. Building capital, seeking comfort. And that design leadership at this point is either being willfully ignorant or just grossly naive, pretending this isn't happening. We need something that kind of prevents us from becoming a problem before it becomes a problem. So what if saying no wasn't more than just a personal preference? What if we could maybe grow up past the BYOE situation, or heaven forbid, a student having to raise their hand in an awkward class and say, look, I'm not sure if I really want to do this project anymore. What if it wasn't required any individual to do anything, but rather we had something that was a little bigger, something as a system of accountability across the whole industry, where we had perhaps a code of ethics, some standards for practice, licensing and accreditation even, continued education and more. I heard from a recent talk, somebody made this beautiful suggestion of why aren't we also having feedback from communities that we do our work with to determine whether or not we get to practice, continue to practice. That sounds great to me. Now, you might be wondering if licensing and accreditation is actually gonna be a bit of a problem because you know, in some fields like uh, architecture, we have it, but in many other professions outside of design, we certainly have it there too. You use it usually as a way of determining whether or not you should work with this individual. What I'm conscious of though is that gatekeeping in design is a very present threat. It has happened for years and I'm not asking for more of it. What I'm asking for more is just simply more accountability. Do you folks see the difference between what I'm describing? Accountability is different than gatekeeping, which we already see a lot of people doing. And I suspect that my hope is that as time goes on, we might start to have a bit of a bifurcation in the industry of clients who are willing to pay for work that is more accountable and designers who are also seeking to be more accountable providing services in that world. And then the, everybody else continuing to act in an unaccountable way as has been the norm. I'm hopeful that that might start to become a little more of a difference between those two worlds, because right now I'd say maybe 0.001% in the accountable and mostly unaccountable right now. I'm hoping that that upper portion starts to grow a little bit. And I feel like there's some hope for this because I wanna peek into the future and see perhaps why I might be hopeful because otherwise this is the most depressing talk to give on a Monday night, as it is. So I wanna introduce you maybe as a bit of a gift, something called the Social Change by Design Database. This is a database that we've been maintaining for several years at the studio where we have a list of almost 300 organizations around the world now doing their design work differently. They're hoping to try and see if they can form their organizations differently, and it's a searchable database around the world where we can see not only the kinds of design work done differently, but also the makeup of the studio. So this is some statistics. Uh, over 60% are more of a consultancy. Um, most of them in North America. Uh, leadership makeup vastly outgrows what is typical in the, in the design studio and most of the organizations over 60% are within one to 10 people. So to me, this gives me some hope that we have design practitioners doing work quite differently than perhaps I was brought up in and perhaps others were brought up in. Because I'm hoping that this kind of new way of design studios will try to be the ones that perhaps lead us towards more accountable work. If you were to go to that database and actually take a look, I'm hopeful that not only might you know new people that should be on the list because you can self-submit new people, 
but also that you can just add yourself. If you feel like you can see a gap in the design industry, feel like somebody's not being served, start a design studio, please. Let me know and then submit it to the database, okay? If we were to pursue that path a little further, perhaps we can start to challenge these roots of how design has been done. That rather than just building capital, we might start to be able to build power. And that perhaps in disrupting how power goes, we might not just seek comfort, but actually seek truth. This, I think, might better match the rhetoric we tell ourselves in design and how the design industry likes to tell the rest of the world that we do. And I'm hopeful that through a lot of dedication, a lot of patience, and probably our leaders that are in this room, we can start to have a different type of design studio doing practice. And I think we actually have everything we need, not only from the people like you in the room, but the very training of doing design, where we handle ambiguity and then come up with new ideas. We're kind of good at this. And I think we can get there if we simply slow down and listen to that quiet little voice that's inside all of us. Thank you very much. I think I'll be ready for Q&A. All right, I'm going to turn off the screen. Bloop. OK. I think there's time for questions. There is, and we have mics to bring around. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and we'll bring you a mic. So you, um, you said at one point that um, design leadership is being willfully ignorant. Mm. Um, and I wondered, as you went from that to the slide that said accountable and unaccountable and that you were hoping that people would want to pay for accountability, um, it seems to me like the um, designers, and I'm thinking here not just about those for social change, but, but designers across the board, when we think about things like the things that we see on our phones and in the grocery store and all of that, seems to me like designers are doing a bang up job, right? Because we're eating the things that they want us to eat and we're you know, tapping on the apps that they want mm -hmm. us to tap mm -hmm. on. Um, we, we just go wherever they want us to go as far as I can tell. So it seems to me like it's all about what the, what the constituencies, the shareholders, whoever they are, what they hire the designers to do, they are accountable. Because it's, you know, if they want profits to go up, right, then they want us to tap on that thing, right? They want us to eat that food. So the constituents or the, the company has to want that, that, they have to want the direction to change. So it, I guess I'm missing where it is that the designers are being willfully ignorant if the mm. people who hired them are telling them to do X. The, if they hire you guys, awesome. I wish more of them would hire you. Yeah, right. but I, I feel like but, the, the, the risk of being hired and, and being used as cover uh, and the risk of being co-opted to provide some type of equity washing is highly present in the work that we do already. So I don't think that there's any pass that we get just because we're doing this type of social sector work. I think that designers are often given briefs, uh, and I think I used the phrase Pavlovian. There's a brief that often triggers us to act in certain ways to then start doing design work. And what I'm asking is, can we pause to check, is it appropriate for us to even look at this brief? And perhaps to write new ones, perhaps, or outright just say, no, we're not going to do this. Which might mean quitting. So okay. I think there's a, there's a question in there, which is, how do we know and who do we trust when we have decisions that are unclear about whether or not we should do this design work? I would actually trust a young designer knowing in their gut what's right or wrong versus the person who wrote the brief for them. So the, so the accountability isn't to what you were charged to do. It's accountability to yourself that you're talking about. And to maybe a greater society. Accountability in that term could be just, we did the job bang up. That, we've already got that. We're handling that well, which is to your observation. I think there's a different type of accountability. Perhaps if you one were to look at how ethical standards tend to work, those are the kinds of accountability I'm seeking. Gotcha. Thank you. Oh, and tell us your name whenever you've got a chance. Hi, um, I'm Robin LeBlanc. I'm in the politics department. Um, 
I'm working right now, uh, in fact, with a student who may or not, may not be here, but on um, space for bicycles. We spent time this summer riding bicycles in Bologna, in Paris, in Cambridge, um, and looking at uh, the extent to which those cities could make space for bicycles. So it's a clearly a space where human-centered design is important and often not employed as well as it could be, <laughs> which you can see when you're on a bike or if you're an elderly person walking down what has suddenly become a bike lane or so forth. Um, but what struck, struck me also is that um, there's a place there for designers actually to be quite dominant, in, maybe in an ethical way. Um, and I don't know how you sort of, I'd, I'd be interested to hear you think about the fact that sometimes the people who want to be designed for, in this case, I would think about the greater public of people who have to transport themselves in a city, don't know things they might need to know, or depending on which public it is, is it the public of people in cars, the public of people on bicycles, the public of pedestrians, um, don't want to make choices that are good for society. Hmm. Um, and so I'm sort of interested in how you would speak to designers about their role in that situation. They get called in, into a, in by a city or something. What do they do? Yeah, I mean, I think that's going to be complicated. Um, there's a probably one tension that we need to talk about is, does payment require, uh, th does getting paid going to get in the way of doing the project? Most often, yes. So then the question becomes, to what degree has all, work already happened in this space, in this town, and particularly with those people? And most often, this has been, I think this was a realization we took, had to start to realize, was that this is likely not the very first time that group of people have been engaged with about this topic area in the past. More likely, they've been engaged and then forgotten about many, many times, and often with designers. So the idea that perhaps this will be new is probably not very helpful. This is something, again, we had to kind of figure out ourselves. Um, so if we were to maybe engage in a topic perhaps like this, we've been maybe trying to wonder what's already happened, what's, what's, what's been ignored, and then what opportunities remain after all of these ideas have already been generated in the past. It kind of shifts, I think, maybe what the role of designer as a progenitor of new ideas that have never been seen in the world through to maybe more facilitative and perhaps more co-design of a role, which I think is not necessarily what most people think about when they think of design. Um, so in those, in those shifts to a new type of function, as a, like a co-pilot to, to a community as opposed to the leader of a community, it does make me wonder perhaps could there still be a way of doing some design work that doesn't, require, doesn't become so dominant or perhaps so problematic. So I think there's still a the role. Um, but I think I'd just be careful about how it was originally framed and perhaps what is the history of harm in that community already. Maybe in many cases by the very same client that we're getting the project from. Thank you. Tell us your name, hi. Hi, I'm Paige. Um, so what inspired you to enter the design industry and how did you get started? Oh, I just wanted to cool, make design cool shit, that's all. It was really, really very basic. And I got to do that, it was really fun. Um, and then I got, perhaps I did wonder if perhaps there was something else going on because I, this just seems like a silly thing, but I was noticing which projects I told my parents about and which ones I didn't. Does anyone have this thing? Like you kind of like self-edit, sometimes because it's too boring or sometimes because it'd be too complicated. But I was noticing I didn't mention most of the projects I worked on, but then would go on and on about a couple. I thought, that's weird. So that's maybe the shift why I started to wonder if perhaps there could be a different kind of design I got to do uh, to starting the studio. But the very basic impetus was just I wanted to design cool stuff. That's all. It's not more sophisticated than that, I'm afraid. Sorry. Thank you. Sure. There's a question up here and then maybe up there. Tell us your name. My name's Natalie. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, and I was just wondering, you mentioned a lot of the projects that you turned down. What's the type of work that you'd pick up like that would be like you'd go for immediately? Yeah, uh, so if, I, if you remember, there was a slide that had all these words across the screen that were all those different type of project. Uh, those are all like the evergreen social issues that we face. Those tend to be the projects we work on. Uh, so one that we're about to uh, work on very soon is around healthcare and around people who are, uh, they're called dual eligible, older adults who are also low income. 
So the way the, way the way the healthcare industry typically works is that if you are in both of those categories, your experience of healthcare can be an absolute nightmare. So we're trying to work out what could be, what could maybe make differences in how the healthcare benefits programs work. Another project we're working on right now is around uh, engaging in reproductive justice. So we're trying to look at what is the landscape of, of smaller on the ground organizations doing sexual reproductive health work that has a justice lens, which typically means women's rights, but for black women in particular, which is a very different type of conundrum, different type of social pressure than white women in those same scenarios. So that type of project is hairy as all hell because the very role that we play and our physical presence in those spaces can determine whether or not people even take our call. So that project, if anything, as a way of triggering was to determine who in our team is even qualified to show up in those spaces. So that's led to a whole bunch of other conversations in our office around um, both eligibility, how we do recruiting, and the high risk of tokenization of the black team members we have. So it's, re it's really difficult. <laughs> um, so it's, it's not as though we're turning down projects because we want to, it's because what we have left behind really requires a lot of care and a lot of thought. Okay? Great, thank, thank you. you so much. There was a, a question, yeah. Hello. Hi, I'm Stephanie Sandberg. I Hi. teach in theater and film. Um, my question is about that gut check. Mm. Have you ever turned down a project and written a breakup letter and then realized you were wrong and then had to go back? And, and like, I'm just wondering, like, have you ever had to reassess or maybe what would that look like? I, I'm just curious as to, you know, the ethics there of like, oh, my, bi my bias kicked in and I didn't know it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I've ever experienced that. So it could be that there's projects we've turned out that were the wrong call. Um, I, I'm not sure if I could tell you if we, when, if we knew that we had made that error. I'm pretty sure that almost all the ones we've broken up with, I only wish we'd done sooner. Oh. But, you, but it's not because we're trying to be like clever about it. It's more just like the clues were there and I just kept ignoring them. It's actually similar to like people that you know that you go out on dates with. You go, there are so many red flags that when you recount the story to someone else, they're like, why are you still in this thing? <laughs> right? Like you can recount like a whole spreadsheet of issues, and yet somehow you think you can save them or that you're the one that can fix this. That, that, that is a common phenomenon for us as a studio, or for me as a person, wishing I could fix this, when actually there was no chance this was ever gonna happen. So I, I, I'm conscious of not making it be like bad clients or good clients or good projects, bad projects. The best language I have these days is that we were gonna be a bad match or we're gonna be a great match. So my projects these days, my, my, my goal is determining as quickly as possible, are we gonna be a bad match and then I can move you out of the way? I feel like that's the most humane thing to do. But thank you for that question. How are we doing? Oh look, there's another question, thank you. These questions have been great, thank you so much. And tell us your name. Hi, I'm Marshall. Um, yeah, I was just kind of wondering, I mean, this isn't really up to you to do, but when you're talking about holding companies accountable and they're using design to, in frankly, ways that aren't great that make them a lot of money and they have obviously incentives to keep doing that and to keep using design in wrong ways, how do you hold them accountable and get them to act in according with say like a code of ethics that you were kind of talking about? I want us to be cautious of actually my ability to do much of anything. I don't know if I can hold anybody accountable. We're a tiny design team of 12 people and I'm hmm. just some dude, you know, I have no power in this. So I can be really annoying if that's the same thing, which it isn't. So if I was like a politician or had more actual power, perhaps to be able to set new policies, maybe we could talk about it. But I want to just be mindful of, mindful of how you phrased it because I feel like it's not accurate. Okay. I'd say it's more likely that I could change how we respond to things that seem unethical or problematic, and we could also change our policies in regard to how we respond to those problematic inquiries. Right, that's kind of what I'm saying. I'm saying it's not your, it's really like not yeah. up, like it's not your responsibility. I was just saying kind of, <clears throat> just kind of as like a country and 
people like I mean I feel like that's a conversation that's worth having how yeah. like do you approach that like what measures can be taken I'd say that one of the ways in which we can do it is to perhaps in some cases actually just not participate in things that are clearly problematic so with treating withdrawing or resisting in some different way could be one of the few acts we have left and I think you can see across the country there are lots of ways in which that's showing up from union actions through other types of disruptions so that we are all on a train that we didn't sign up for, which I think makes capitalism such a powerful phenomenon because it means that we're already rushing in both direction and speed that we didn't necessarily agree on. And anything that wanted to prevent it, slow it down or change course, it seems completely out of my ken. So whether or not we are still on that train in every instance might mean perhaps jumping off occasionally. And that's one of the few ways in which we feel like we can maybe resist. So it's, it's uh, it's very difficult. Um, if you can, come to the workshop tomorrow, which feels like a bit of a cop-out to your question. Um, but in that workshop, we're going to try to see if we can develop questions just for you, not, not for me. And can those questions perhaps be a resistive act? And I think when we develop questions that are meaningful for you, you can start to see, I can't. It's not like I'm choosing not to participate because I'm going to have a bad time. I actually can't participate any longer. And that clarification, I think, is helpful because sometimes you realize, I, I can no longer be part of this X project, organization, uh, path, whatever it might be. Uh, thank you. Yeah. What a depressing set of answers so far. Tell, tell us your name. Hello, I'm Herb Rubenstein. I graduated from this university 50 years ago. Wow, thanks for coming back. Thanks, cool. I, li I live here now. Have you had any design projects regarding artificial intelligence? It certainly seems that many universities are going to have to redesign some of their core elements because of AI. Uh, the closest we ever got to it was a project for the Gates Foundation uh, where the phenomena of AI being used to evaluate English essays is a group. Yeah, so, so I wasn't aware of this at all. But in a lot of classrooms through middle school and high school, the pressure for a teacher to have creative writing to be given to students and then give great feedback and have them do them again multiple times is quite high, but the time to do that high quality feedback is very, very low. So the pressure for teachers to assign uh, AI as an evaluation tool to more quickly get feedback to that, to that student is becoming a really present phenomena. I, again, I was not familiar with this at all. So, uh, a program officer at the Gates Foundation who was very concerned about this asked if we could design principles for how the new AI could be designed. So that's the closest we ever got to a project on AI. I have real reservations about it in general. Not that project, but just AI in general. Um, because I think it seems like a phenomenon that can't be stopped, even though perhaps it should. So I have some real reservations around its utility. Um, we came close to another project which actually led to a breakup email. This was really fun. Do you mind if I do a quick detail? We had a client who was, um, uh, they run one of the very few uh, autonomous car, like taxi companies in the country, okay? And uh, there aren't that many of them, you can figure it out. So they approached us to see if we could do AI-driven cars. And we're like, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. What about the drivers? They're like, well, we don't have any drivers. I know, but how does this impact drivers as a class? As in like labor, they're like, yeah, we can't touch that. So well, then we can't do the project. And we just stopped, like the email just stopped. And then a year goes by, and then they email us back and say, look, we, have a, we might be able to do a project now on the thing you talked about, which is like, how does the impact of AI and labor go together? I said, wow, that's fascinating. I didn't know that you'd call us, call us back. What a great chance, let's, like, let's actually try to write this. So then we started writing the actual proposal, which we never got that far. And then we got to the bit where it says, how are we gonna do recruiting? We then asked a new, a new question that, that blew everything up, which was, when we go and recruit people who are interested in being you know, interviewed for this project, how do we explain the role of AI in this project, knowing that you're the client? And then it all went off the rails again. So we were really keen to work out, well, let's, let's go do a thing. And then it turns out, actually, I don't know if anybody really wants to. I mean, I'd be happy to try. And I think giving an earnest, good faith effort is, is appetite on our end. But I want to be able to work out with perhaps these AI clients what happens when we find out that people don't want the thing that you're selling. I, I'd like to know how you'll respond to that. Not you, but just others.
Hi, my name is Elizabeth. I'm with the museums at, at WNL here on campus. And I, I have a question that's related to both your question and the, the previous question, which is sort of with the case that you just described, this, these breakup emails, this is an unusual practice, right? And I'm wondering if there are, if that's a, something you've seen more than once where it catches their attention and is that part of it? Because with ethics, one of the things that I really struggle with uh, both on a personal and professional level is, you know, is simply not participating in something that rubs me the wrong way. Is that enough? Mm. Like, is it enough for me to just t remove myself or do I have to like, where's the obligation to do more? And, and have you, is, is that part of these breakup emails? I mean, if you're only a, tw a team of 12, yes, you are small, but are you catching their attention and, and, and is that part of why you're doing this? Um. I don't know if any one individual organization we've talked to then leads to like systemic change. Uh, and maybe depending on who we talk to, perhaps that could be. In the c case of the Gates example, I spoke to, I think it was like the 50 top program officers for uh, US education. And I think when we talked, uh, did the presentation similar to this, I described that my fear of being in this room isn't that we'll leave without a project. My worry is I will leave with a project. And I said that the, the risk of doing a project and then screwing something up without the Gates Foundation behind us will be typically contained to Chicago. But if we do a project with you and screw something, and now we're on the scale of the whole United States, that is terrifying to me. So I feel like I'm justified in being cautious about being in a room like the Gates Foundation with this, you know, speaking in Seattle. And I think that pissed off 49 out of the 50 program officers and caught the attention of one of them. So there can be stances one can take to at least set, your, set the ground rules. And then as you get into conversations, you have to be cautious to say, do we still want to do this? Because again, the risk of harm continues to escalate as you go further. So a lack of participation is only one approach. But if you need to, the whistleblower approach is the other option on maybe the other end, which is you actually have to report something is really, really suspicious. So I think there are multiple options. I don't think anybody has to do any of this. And Sonny, don't listen to me for, for, for any advice. Although I'm happy to talk about it if you, if you need to. But the idea that perhaps you have an inkling that something might be up, I usually find talking to some other peers where you could be well received is a good start. And if need be, then maybe talking to the press. I'm kind of joking, but kind of not. <laughs> All right, Paul, last question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Paul. And I just have a question about when it comes for you to decide if something is ethical and you want to take a project. Do you measure whether the harm is outweighing the good, or do you want there to be no harm at all whatsoever when oh, it comes to Oh, that's such a, a good question to end on. What a nightmare question. Um, <laughs> I don't know how we would measure it. I mean, I think there are some basic rules of whether or not there's people, whether the person or the people we're talking to are at risk of harm. So there's probably, there's a few clues. There are people who are in the world that have protected class status. Do you, do you know what I'm familiar with, right? There are some groups of people that have already been deemed to be vulnerable. So let's start there. That's usually a good start. So if it's someone that you're talking to or you might do in research or might impact or is already in one of those classes, let's add it to the tally of like, oh, this might be worth some, 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 some care. If that starts to get beyond a certain point, I don't know what that threshold should be. You might go, like either we have to do heavy, heavy intervention to prevent new harms or if it goes beyond a really high point, we can't participate at all. I think there can be some guidelines. I would love to talk to some lawyers who know, perhaps there's a lady behind you. Uh, there are some lawyers who could advise us on this, but I think that it requires a lot of frank conversations at a, at a leadership level in per or design organization to work out really what is the risk of harm here. And I would not be coy about it because I think the risk of harm is always present. All right, thanks so much. Hey, thank you so much, that was great. So everyone, as you are departing, the next lecture in this series will be October 26th. It's Jennifer Blumenthal Barbie who will be talking about choice architecture. It's going to be really interesting, so I'll see you there.